my friends, the great experiment. Discovery. Discovery. Hidden. Trink. Trink. Would you look at that? The greatest trink. Trink. And you people, you're all astronauts. Some kind of star. Trink. Trink. The greatest trink. Welcome to Greatest Trek. It's a new Star Trek podcast from the makers of The Greatest Generation. I'm Ben Harrison. I'm Adam Pranica in the feed a little early, huh? This is that they're dropping two episodes on us, so we're dropping two episodes on them. When you have a professional Star Trek podcasting outfit like we do, <laughs> able to marshal all the resources mm. around getting something out in a timely fashion, yeah, it's The Greatest Trek promise, right? It sure is, Adam. I loved being able to do this. Yeah. I loved uh, watching this episode early so that we can edit it early so that people can have it very close to on time. Imagine just living your life out there on a Tuesday, not expecting a new episode of Greatest Trek. Look at us. Look at us. (laughs) We're doing it. Yeah. Boy, and some real turnaround in feelings about characters in this episode. Already here in uh, in this season, they're turning my feelings about characters on their heads. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't think I changed my opinion of uh, of many people at all this episode. I'm wondering where <laughs> I might have lost the thread. Maybe I'm the one that's wrong, Adam. It's okay. Did we watch the same episode? <laughs> Let's find out as we begin our conversation about Star Trek Discovery. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> season five? <laughs> Ep- episode two? <laughs> Under, Under the Twin Birds! <laughs> you know the greatest danger facing us is an irrational fear of the unknown. In the last time on Real Ben, I wanted to ask you, do you think they were trying to make a drinking game where you have to drink every time they say the names <laughs> Mole and Locke? Um, yeah, because I was pretty fucked up by the <laughs> time we got to Burnham's Log. <laughs> when I was editing video, for corporate especially, I think it's easy for an interview subject to like fall into the patter of saying the same things in the same way. Mm-hmm. And I often found myself like scalpeling out that stuff to make it sound less repetitive. But when you see a last time on package like this cut in this specific way, like it really hits you like how often specific names are used to forward the story. Right. And when they're compressed in this like 45 second package, it's mole and lock and mole and lock and mole and lock and mole and lock. <laughs> Never lock and mole, you know? Yeah. You know what? Lock told mole. She could have the first name. He's kind of progressive <laughs> like that. That was very big of him. Uh-huh. We start with the with the Burnham's log that sort of reminded me of uh the captain's log. I think it's Star Trek, not Star Trek into Darkness. What's the one? Oh, Star Trek Beyond. Was that the last JJ Star Trek? Is that the one where Kirk does a log about like drinking coffee and wearing the same uniform every day and and being kind of bored of it he's like god this five-year mission really like isn't isn't holding my attention anymore i uh i don't like my job and uh i don't think i'm gonna go anymore and i kind of felt like captain burnham is spider-man but i think she's also a little kirky here in in the sense of that kirk where she's feeling like listlessness and purposelessness and to me, it feels very much like that is because she is not fighting a threat that is on a galactic scale right at the moment. Like she's got her teeth into an interesting mystery, but no sense yet that it's going to kill all sentient species everywhere or anything. So, you know, who cares? <laughs> that was always enough. But lately, it's not. It really feels like this articulates the arc for the whole season. And it seems like that arc is informed largely by the Barbie song. Like, (laughs) what was Burnham made for? What is this season for? What is the reason for all of this? What happens when they meet the people who made life in the universe? And why doesn't this guy look like the person Spock killed in Star Trek V. All of these questions come up in this log. Does this guy also need a starship? 
<laughs> That's what I'd want to know. <laughs> you know what's a fucking mind blower, Ben? Hmm. Is that Burnham has no idea that that ever happened because in her life that didn't happen yet. And then she right. she leapfrogged over it. Mm-hmm. Maybe it never did in her timeline. I think in her timeline it did, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I guess so. Or didn't it? Who knows? Well, the ship is getting fixed up post-avalanche. It's got lots of dust on the windows that the dots are taken care of. It's like parking in L.A. Just like <laughs> you wash your car, and then uh, 45 minutes later, thick layer of pollen. Happens every time. Today is the last day of work for Saru, and he gets one last mission to go out on, and this is it. You want to make sure you turn off your picture of uh, the progenitor. Mm -hmm. If you have a progenitor in a tab, you got you to gotta close that thing if Saru walks in, right? <laughs> it's really hard for me not to call the progenitor change leader because it's the yeah. same actor in the same, in very similar loaf. Do you ever think about how the choices made in past Star Trek with respect to the budget and the fit and finish they could put on an alien species means so much in an episode like this. Like if you're going back to the well and you're going to pull something up for use in new Star Trek, yeah, it can't look like the worst thing. And this guy <laughs> doesn't. Like the progenitor does not look bad. He just looks fine. But they never could have used someone that looked bad from Star Trek The Next Generation. Otherwise, this whole thing wouldn't work. Right. The fish versus dog people couldn't be one of the callbacks that they use to build an entire season arc yeah. and discovery out of. Yeah. You know, the conversation is like semi, semi sad, like everybody's happy for Saru, but, uh, but yeah, he's going to be out. And, uh, before they go on the mission, Burnham is asked to attend a meeting where for some reason, the president of the Federation is the interlocutor trying to get to the bottom of what happened on the world that they were on last week when the avalanche happened, because it seems like Captain Rayner is like getting blamed for what happened, even though it was just his action that inspired it in the bad guys. The president's like, you have no idea what a pain in the ass that dirt bike rental guy is. <laughs> like... He will not stop calling me. It is. <laughs> I cannot get anything done. It's like, I want to change my number at this point. Cause like, how did he get my, <laughs> the president's direct line? But like, also I'm the president. So if I change my phone number, like so many people need to be notified about my new number. You it's know, actually like <laughs> more of a pain in the ass if I did that. Like we're getting to the breaking point where that is actually the smaller pain in the ass, but like overall, it's just a giant pain in the ass is what I'm trying to stress. It's less about the giant dirt avalanche and the town that was almost squished by it. And it's more about this fucking guy renting <laughs> dirt bikes on the outskirts of town. That's the real problem here. And for some reason, I just need to know if y'all were on the same page throughout this mission. And Michael Burnham isn't going to narc out on anyone. No. She's like, everything went the way exactly how we wanted it to. I wouldn't tell you what my opinion was, even if it was different from his, which to be clear, I'm not saying it was or wasn't. It takes Admiral, is this guy flirting with me or just really, really good looking to kind of get Michael Burnham to drop the charade here. He's like, hey, you don't have to like, be the sort of captain that covers for another captain. Like, tell us what's really happening. Yeah, I mean, it is Admiral Guy who's really into medium format photography because it's artistic, but it's also really expensive. But it's also Rainer turning to her and going like, why don't you tell them? <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't need you to cover for me here. You had no problem voicing your opinion in the field, Captain. I love Rainer's, I don't care if I live or die in this meeting, <laughs> energy to this. He goes off. He's like uh, Pedro Pascal in that Nicolas Cage movie. Like the meme is him driving the car and like looking over at him <laughs> <laughs> all crazy and on drugs. That's yeah. Captain Rayner here in this scene. He is painted as being a bit like Kirk in Undiscovered Country where like 
the war is over, but he can't let the war end. Like he is like a captain from a different era kind of guy. I hate dirt bike rental counters and I always have. <laughs> I'll never forgive them for the death of my credit card. <laughs> 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 so uh so Burnham uh relents and says, Yeah, I thought it was a bad call, and I told them as much at the time. And meeting breaks up, uh, or I guess it's it's a break, but Captain Burnham does need to come back. So uh she and Admiral, who definitely has a bottle membership at a Japanese whiskey bar, uh take a walk down the hallway and they're talking about who is gonna replace Saru and it sort of seems like Book might be the nominee from Admiral who low-key does Pike's hair as well as or better than Pike. Do you get the sense that the Admiral kind of relishes this bomb throwing he's he's getting to do here? <laughs> you know he's got like a cheeky side to him, you know? <laughs> I guess we need every possible reason it takes to put Michael Burnham and Book in a room together or on a starship together, and this qualifies. Yeah. So he's checking into his new cabin, which, uh, oh boy, it already has a mouse problem. First thing he does is uh, check under the mattress. Then he uh, puts the remote control into a Ziploc bag. Here's what I always do. (laughs) Take the tissue box out of the bathroom. Why is it Hmm. taking up all the bathroom counter space? There's so little counter space in any hotel room bathroom. You get it out of there. You get those glasses out of the bathroom. Why are there glass glasses in the bathroom? And then like tear that first couple of sheets of toilet paper off the roll that have been folded into a point or like a flower or something. Because like, do I really want to touch that with something that somebody's had their fingertips all over? Yeah. I find that little fold out luggage rack that you put your suitcase on. That's always fun. Mm -hmm. Tear all the homophobic shit out of the Bible. Put that back in the drawer. You know what, Ben? My wife and I got one of those folding luggage rack things for our guests. You know what? When you have guests, sometimes it's fun to like get a gift for yourself, too. <laughs> that really gives us joy. Yeah. Was that a like a guest moon gift? Yeah. Pretty sweet. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> Do the transporters beam the poops out of the cat here also? Ooh. I hope so, because those bare floors are getting fucking covered with litter, if not. Oh, yeah. That's a huge problem. And like scratched up, right? Because it's like a hard surface with a hard substance. That's not good. The more book says something like, I just go where they tell me. So now I'm here. The more it's like, me thinks book doth go where they tell me too much. (laughs) Have you noticed this quality to him? We're two episodes in and he said this a bunch of times. Like, we get it, book. You really don't want to be here. It's like when you go out of your way many times to let the stranger you're talking to at the bar know that you're married. (laughs) You know? (laughs) Yeah, who's the they he is talking about? Is it like the voices in his head? No, I mean, in this context, it's like... It's the Federation. Yeah, yeah. But also, like, did he tell them to tell him? Burnham gives him a quickie here. A quickie mission briefing. Mm. And it's a real last time on moment that happens in the episode. He is going to be on the mall and lock problem. Got to work those names in a couple more times. Yeah, you're like eight shots in at this point. Yeah, fucking hammered. Michael! Where, how are you? Where are you? Oh, it's warm in here, isn't it? Yeah, like working up a psych profile on them and working up everything that they learned from the video footage they got of the book that Fred the Android read. And uh, then we learn a little bit more about Lyric, the planet that we're heading to. They refer to it as a necropolis from an extinct species. The twin moons that have been much referenced, uh, both in the title of this episode and also in the drawing in the diary, uh, like eclipse the planet every seven years in this one spot. And this necropolis is built right in the center of the shadow of that eclipse. So it's a, it seems like it's a very holy site to this extinct species. I mean, holy from all of the uh, burial plots. (laughs) 
Mm. <laughs> yeah. And also in a religious context. Ben, did you get the idea that like the entire planet was covered in necropoli? Oh, there's more than sufficient to like obscure like because the idea that these moons cast the part, like the yeah. shadow where the places that they're supposed to go is located, like it made me wonder if that was really necessary to finding its location. I didn't wrap my mind around that. I was too distracted by Tilly. She's back on the ship. She's here. Everyone is here. Very happy that you're back. <laughs> Even if it is just temporary. Thanks. Do you think if Dana Carvey wrote a really funny song on SNL about a chef who worked at a cemetery, it would be called uh, Chopping the Cropoli? <laughs> yeah, I do think that. Okay. If he wrote a really funny song about that, it would that's what it would be called. Only if. So there's also like an electromagnetic field around the necropolis that prevents them from beaming in close. Uh, and so they're like, we're going to beam you well a ways and you're going to have to walk the rest of the way in or steal some blue horses, you know, depending on who's down there. Or ride Saru like a horse because he runs like a fucking Clydesdale. And we know this about him. Yeah. Please show us horse Saru. Please. Yeah. <laughs> One thing about the efficiency of disco is that, like, the second the decision is made about where to beam down, they are down there because you don't have to go to the transporter room anymore. Yeah. And uh, Michael and Saru are the entirety of the away team. And first thing I noticed about this planet is there is so much fucking shit in the air here. There's just shit floating around everywhere. I wanted to start sympathy sneezing. Oh, my God. For, for all the allergens that seem to be floating around. Was that real shit, or was they were they adding the shit in post? Like, did they just drop particle systems on every clip and render them out? It looks pretty good for shit. It does. I was, like, looking really close to see if any of it was, like, landing on Sonequa Martin-Green's hair and staying yeah. there. And it seemed like sometimes it was. And then I was like, was there like one little piece of shit that floated down in one take that they liked? And they're like, fuck, there's shit on her fucking hair. What are we going to do about this? We'll just add shit in every shot so that it isn't distracting. Yeah, they didn't care about these things back when old Star Trek was getting made. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, they would have shot this on like a 11 by 17 soundstage with the psych pressing against the back of their heads and yeah. a couple of potted plants from the Sears Garden Center in old Star Trek. So instead, it's like some forest outside of Toronto that they've brought lots of tropical plants into. They establish right away that Mull and Locke aren't there because they have recalibrated their sensors to pick up where their their cloak could be found. They have not found that cloak, so they have not found Mull and Locke. It seems like they're there by themselves. So they make their way to the pyramid in the center of this location, and that's where they're going to start out. That, that, that is now your chair, Captain. Uh, ship. Meanwhile, Book and Culber uh, have a little reunite hug that doesn't really seem like Book is into. Like, <laughs> Yeah, Culber's like that guy who's like, I'm a hugger. Yeah. You just got to let me hug you. <laughs> You don't have a choice. I get to hug you. Yeah. And like that isn't the most non-consensual part of this interaction. He wants to go deep on book like right away. Yeah. Are we sure they have a doctor patient relationship or does Culber just assume this? It's really intense. Culber is like, I really care whether or not that makes you uncomfortable. I need you to know that I really care about how you're doing. And they start looking at footage of Mullenlock's ship when it bugged out and did its little trick with all the warpies. Mm -hmm. And Book reads the body language of the ship and is like, these two are in love because they're doing fun shit together and like being free in their expression of love, which causes them to do flashy shit when they're flying their spaceship. He watches the ropes shoot out from the ship over and over again, and he's like, God, <laughs> nothing makes you blast like new love. 
like <laughs> the floor, the ceiling, all the walls. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> really knocks your socks off, doesn't it, Dr. Culver? The Culver's like writing this down. So he's like, yeah, window, <laughs> walls. Okay, yeah, that's that's compelling. This is this is good uh, psych profile stuff. We can build a case on this. Books like uh, they do what they like and they like what they do. Yeah. And back on the surface, Michael Burnham tells Saru about a little thing he doesn't know. A reputation that he's got, a nickname that he's been given. Action Saru. Why do they call you Action anyway? Ah, oh, yes. You've heard it before. I find it quite humorous. He's a cub who carries no weapon. My ferocity, the use of my wills, struck a rather strong chord with her. He's a maverick who answers to no one. I shall follow your lead. He's a man who's no dog. Action Saru. And all action. Yeah, come on, you know. Action Saru. When it calls for action. Do it! He's the one to call. Did you know you have a nickname? Action Saru. And action is on the way. Nobody calls him that, Michael Burnham. <laughs> Quit trying to make Action Saru happen. Like, Action Jackson works because there's like an internal yeah. rhyme. It's like, it's like fun to say, yeah. you know. Action Saru is nothing. And he's like retiring from Starfleet to go become an ambassador. It's going to become less and less a thing. Like, you can't give somebody a nickname right on the verge of it being irrelevant, you know? Everyone got together behind Saru's back and they're like, look. We've been calling this guy Dirty Dog Dick Finger Saru <laughs> for like the last four years, but he's retiring. So we got to we gotta do better than that. Maybe on his way out, we give him this gift of yeah. action Saru. What do you think? And they're like, yeah, we agree. And they're like, all right, but it shouldn't be action Saru. Like we should come up with something better, but then they just never had the follow-up meeting. Like action pack dog dick finger Saru. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's still too much. <laughs> <laughs> We'd have to go back through the footage, and I don't think we have time, but, like, did Jet Reno ever actually say this? <laughs> like, he says, like, oh, yeah, Jet said it because, like, I shot a guy with my ganglia quills one time, and she was really impressed by it. Hopefully this is supported by some evidence later on in the season. Yeah. Like, we need a flashback to Jet Reno making this case. Yeah. Because otherwise, I'm not buying it. I think Tig could persuade me that this is a good nickname. Let me see what I can do. This is one of those scenes, Ben, where they're eulogizing each other to their faces. Like, she's yeah. so happy for him. And the topic changes, you know, from that into, like, who would make a good number one for her? And Saru recommends Book? What? Why is everyone trying to make Book and Burnham happen? They're so interested in book burn naming. <laughs> <laughs> They're pro book burnum. <laughs> <laughs> and Ben, I just want to say it. I don't think that's right. Yeah. Maybe the right wingers that say Star Trek has gone woke are finally excited yeah. about this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Look out for that very popular merch item in podshop.biz, the I'm pro book burnum <laughs> t-shirt. <laughs> We're putting it on a t-shirt. We're putting it on a coffee mug. Yeah. We're putting it on flip-flops. Put putting it on a hat. <laughs> yeah. Uh so uh he is also like the ad I mean he's more explicit about it than the Admiral, but mm -hmm. I think they're both kind of writing for a book getting this job. Uh, we cut back up to the ship, and Adira is talking to Tilly about feeling pretty okay with Gray being out of the picture. Like, love Gray, but also nice being away from Gray. I don't know. I kind of like it. It's nice to have a break from your special person. Look, I say this all the time. I like missing my wife. That's a good thing. It's good. It's not bad. And she fucking loves having a vacation for me. <laughs> yeah. I loved how the science lab scanner that they have up on the ship looks like the miniaturized version that Michael Burnham is looking at on mm -hmm. her tricorder. Like when she holds her wrist up and has like 
a little topography map of the area. It's like a littler, less detailed version of the one that they have up on the ship. And they are, you know, looking for the center of of the dot. And up on the ship, they notice that uh, some extra EM readings are going off. And down on the planet, they're walking past the severed head of a giant stone statue and all four of its eyes open and they start getting attacked by Echo Peeper 607s. So good. I love this effect. I love how creepy it looks when those eyes open up. I just wanted to talk about the head itself Mm -hmm. as a prop because like, obviously they didn't find a giant stone head in the forest and go, this is our location. Mm -hmm. Like they had to build this head and take it into some forest somewhere. And that is like harder in television production than you might think. Like something this big to not make it out of super lightweight materials because also Michael Burnham has to like jump through the air onto this thing and climb up it and it can't like rock back and forth like it's made out of styrofoam and balsa wood. It's got to be that perfect middle of stable enough to be interacted with but not so heavy to be unwieldy. Right. Like if it was actually solid stone, it would be impossible to put there and like too expensive to make in the first place. And this thing was flawless. Like it it looked great. It looked like it had been sitting there moldering in the forest for yeah. 2000 years, but it also like, you know, was super heavyweight feeling on screen. Like, I love that the eyes opened up. I love that they had the foresight to, like, have a way to shoot out of the eyes for a couple of the shots. Um, it, was just, it was just a super cool set in a place that just feels unique and, and different in a, in a way that I think Discovery is routinely really good at. Yeah. This is a big, big problem for Saru and Michael Burnham, who have hidden under a giant foot. And it's a problem because they can't beam away, as stated before. And it's also a problem because it, the statue is really into foot stuff. <laughs> Them being down there and like tickling the bottom of its feet and the drones shooting the top. It's like it's like kind of getting off on that. My guess is that the alien society that, that settled here were Talaxians. For their interest in those giant feet. Mostly foot stuff is what they're into. <laughs> oh! So uh, they got to figure out what the power source is that is causing these drones to even work and Tilly and Adira are kind of like in a panic trying to work on this when the ship tells them that they've got a priority transmission from Starfleet and they're like come on (laughs) give me a break we're in the middle of an emergency right now and Rainer just kind of like shows up in the room as a hologram and He's there to help. He's like, yeah, I've been on a bunch of these uh, red missions or whatever. Like, what? what's the problem? What are we working? And not only that, when Rainer talks about his own ability to blurp in anywhere, wherever he wants, like, this is something he can do at any time. Yeah. He's like ceiling cat. <laughs> <laughs> that happened to me recently where I was, I was playing Baldur's Gate 3 in between two records and you popped up on my screen and just watched me play video games. For- <laughs> I did. Yeah. I'm lucky that I was playing video games and not doing something else in here. I know. That would have changed things utterly between us. If I had been tubing. Marcus, this is very serious. You can't look at porn while in the office. We should be able to uh, look at a little porn at work. Rainer's there to get them to think differently about how to determine what sort of power supplies these eyeball guns. How the planet supplies power to what? What did you name them? Echo Peeper 607. <laughs> How they supply power to the Echo Peeper 607. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) And they run it down really fast and then finally find their possible solution. It involves uh, doing an EM pulse. He's admonishing them not to think in 32nd century terms, but in, I guess, 30th century terms, because this is a 2,000-year-old statue. Right. So, yeah, it's uh, whatever this this ambient EM field on this planet is, is probably what the power source is. So use an EMP. It's an interesting moment because 
it doesn't seem like Michael Burnham is really on board with it at first when it's first suggested. And it's not suggested to her by Rainer. It's, you know, it's coming from Tilly and Adira and Saru. And I thought it was a really nice moment because her gut is to go in a different direction with solving this problem. And she like hears some people whose opinions she trusts and respects and changes her mind in the moment. And then they have to have another argument about who's going to do which thing. Like, is Saru going to run and put the guns in the eyes or is Michael Burnham going to run and put the things in the eyes? And the other Make one... Make Saru a horse. <laughs> Come on. Show, show him running. Yeah. Boy, do they show him running in this episode. Oh, my God. This is the best. He is going to be the drone fodder. Burnham sets up the head, the bomb. Saru is just like running serpentine between the trees. And hey, Ben, if if Saru is the drone fodder, does he uh, make them a ganglia they can't refuse? <laughs> I mean, he does make them a ganglia that they can't refuse. <laughs> he shoots like three or four Echo Peeper 607s dead with his fucking attack ganglia. So kick ass. They did a great job giving us a lot of Saru running. I could use so much more of this. Yeah, do you feel like they are writing him off the show early? Like, is he not going to make it to the end of this season? I mean, they are going to need to stitch two torpedo casings together for that funeral, right? Do <laughs> you, you think they're going to fold him over into one? No, I, was, I wasn't I was saying they were going to kill him. I was thinking he oh. was like going to go be an ambassador and like be somebody that they occasionally see at HQ or whatever. Oh, I assume death. <laughs> and ironically, he would not sense the coming of it when it mm. finally gets him. <laughs> There's a moment like after the pulse goes where you're not sure if Saru survived this, but uh, fortunately... He only got kind of lightly grazed on one shoulder. And I loved the detail that the light on his armor is kind of blinking on and off because of that. Like, <laughs> a little bit on the fritz because of his battle damage. Action Saru. How about that? Maybe he does get called Action Saru from now on. Ah, yes. So they make more hand phasers because I guess they have an infinite amount of them. Yeah, you could just replicate another one. That's pretty great. So they replicate yeah. another couple of dustbusters and they uh, continue the reconnoiter. We need to score a lot of black fast. Licensed businessmen. Well, there's a new ship. You treat her like a lady. You treat her like a lady. She'll always bring it home. Meanwhile, up on the ship, Stamets is working on that schematic from the diary. When I saw that thing, I was thinking it was like a galaxy map. You know how they like sometimes have mm -hmm. the like concentric rings and the little sections. Doesn't really seem like that's the direction they're going with that. Um, Book and Culbert interrupt, and they're in the engineering section. And Book really wants to talk to Mall and Locke, and um, he has this like special comms array for dark comms because he says that they're sueys which is like a type of courier that does like really dirty courier work for extra money. You know, like squeal for a courier is sort of the <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> yeah. And so Book rolls in with like, you know, the version of the Big Gulp that's like 200 ounces and like a plastic <laughs> bucket with a handle. That's what this prop looks like. Yeah. And you're like, I mean, like it's marketed to truckers and I get it that they're like, long haul guys or whatever, but like, ugh, I mean, that's just so much liquid calories. And they're like, they're definitely like using that thing as a toilet on the truck <laughs> afterwards, right? When I was a projectionist, I would fill up my giant vessel about that size in the morning off of the soda fountain. I would just tug on that thing all day. God damn. All the way through an eight hour shift. <laughs> just a totally disgusting amount of soda. <laughs> Holy shit, man. Kept me sharp for keeping focus on the edge where I got to be. <laughs> I told you when we got together, baby, you were going to have to share me with every trailer reel. 
<laughs> yeah. So book uh, book Jacks into the dark comms web. He knows just what to say to get the attention of a couple action junkies. Yeah. The way he describes them sounds almost exactly like how the cops describe the ex-presidents in the movie Point Break. Did you notice that? So what have we got a mall and lock so far? 27 banks in three years. They use hybridized tech from a variety of different species. They control the room well. They don't shy away from physical confrontation, though they're not violent just for the sake of it. We're talking about solid professionals. Yeah. In a cool way. Right. In a way that makes them sound kind of awesome. So this is like we start intercutting like pretty fast here uh, because meanwhile, down on the planet, Saru and Burnham find this monument that like it seems like Mullen Locke like phasered it to destroy the information that was on it. But we also find out that they only have like three or four minutes before the EM field comes back and thus the Echo Peeper 607s come back. So they're like reading this Romulan poetry and like trying to decipher it. And the couriers show up in hologram form in engineering after Stamets like clears the room. So it's only like senior officers in there and book and book is like, Hey, like, let me just buy the diary from you. Like stop running around. Like we could just like do some business here, but they know what they're chasing now. And the more book talks, the more, suspicious he sounds also yeah he kind of spooks the horses you know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It turns out mole has heard tell of cleveland booker uh when uh when he reveals his name she seems to recognize it but yeah they're not inclined to play ball with him and meanwhile down on the surface with like 40 seconds left saru super strengths the monument out of the way because there's like four stanzas of the poem visible and Romulans always hide the front door to their house. Therefore the fifth stanza must be hidden under. Mm -hmm. And they also find a, like a little gadget down there. Yeah. I love that Burnham just rips a piece of this thing out before they leave (laughs) where up to and including this point, she's been so precise about like wanting to leave the campsite better than how they found it, you know? Right. Yeah, a lot of work done in dialogue about how this is like a holy site, even though like the species to whom it is holy is long extinct, like a holy site that they are going to treat with the utmost respect. Burnham goes out of her way to be really considerate, both in this part and like, did you get that part in the first episode where when Fred gets shot, he's like, notify Fred's family. (laughs) Yeah. It's the right thing to do. Like, what? Fred's got a family? Okay. All right. (laughs) Let's find him. I mean, Fred definitely has a twin brother somewhere, right? Guess so. Big family Fred comes from. Yeah. She grabs it. They move the the monument back to like rehide the thing. Uh, Because like if you only have the first four stanzas, it indicates Beta Z is where you got to go for the next clue. Mm -hmm. But if you you get the fifth stanza, not Beta Z. When they get back up to the ship, like they, they're beamed up like moments before getting disrupted by more Echo Peeper 607s. And uh, and they're like, okay, well, well, we'll send some dots down to like fix the monument up and presumably also get shot. Yeah, we'll see if the robots start fighting each other down there. <laughs> and also we'll leave some sensors in orbit to see if the couriers return. Could the Spider-Man suit that Michael Burnham wore in the first episode have come in handy here if they were taking weapons fire from these Echo Peepers 607s? Oh. Wouldn't that have helped? Seems like it would have, yeah. Yeah, that breaks the episode, though. Yeah. So they manufacture kind of like a, a holder to put this artifact in that they found and it's like one piece of five that they need to collect. It's a real... Over-the-cylinder artifact holder? Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, and the they decipher the, the clues in the Romulan poem, and it looks like they're going to have to go to Trill for the next piece. And this is just crazy, because Adira just said the thing about <laughs> being kind of cool not having gray around all the time. Oh, this sucks. <laughs> And you're just like, maybe I'll just stay behind on the HQ base. 
you know? Yeah. Find something to do there. And if you really need me, like I can warp over to you because the HQ can do that. But maybe I shouldn't. I'm kind of disappointed. I wanted to go to Beta Zed. Like we've been to Trill on this show. I want to see that plant that has come in it again. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to have a nice picnic on Beta Zed, wear a really deep V. Yeah. Eat some weird fruits and think about Luxana Troy's dead <laughs> daughter. <laughs> trink, trink, trink. Would you look at that? We have a scene uh, in Book's apartment, I think, where he admits to Culber that Mull is, uh, in fact, the previous Cleveland Booker's daughter. Tell you what, man, if you're looking at pictures of a little girl in your quarters, you better turn off the screen before Culber walks in. <laughs> pretty messed up, book. And what's going on here seems pretty pervy. <laughs> this episode is like giving like AI prompt ideas to the sickest people on the internet. <laughs> God, and book just cannot shake Culber off of his shit. But Mole is the closest thing to family that he's got left. Mole is like a distant cousin? How does that work? I think, like, Cleveland Booker was his mentor, and it's a little bit like uh, the Dread Pirate Roberts, where you get your name from your previous oh, yeah. mentor. But she's actually related to the previous Cleveland Booker. Right. Which is why it kind of, like, hit her like a ton of bricks when he said his name. Mm -hmm. um, and he's never actually met her, but he's, like, seen a picture of her, so... But, like, when you think back to their interaction when he was doing the dark comms call... The whole temperature of that conversation changed when he introduced himself, but it like wasn't clear whether that was positive or negative right. on Mole's face, right? Yeah. Well, the temperature also changed because like, I mean, he put a lot of ice in the container, but I mean, it was also like a shit ton of soda, so it <laughs> melts, you know? That really was the technique. When I would get to the theater before open and I filled up that giant vessel, you don't want to over ice it. Yeah, You got to trust the vessel to keep it cool throughout the day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Plus, you can always add ice later. Sure. <laughs> uh. I mean, if you wanted to go down to the floor during times when the theater was open, and as a projectionist, I got to tell you, that is the very last place you want to go. You don't want somebody coming up to you and asking you for a refund on your tickets because it was a little bit out of focus. That's what's funny about being a projectionist is sometimes uh, you can create a problem that it is not your job to fix, you know? Like, <laughs> you're up there working the film stuff. Those refunds, that's someone else's business. And that's my problem because... Oh, wait, no. It's not my problem. The brain wrap is on me. <laughs> the refunds are on you. I'm just up here drinking 128 ounces of soda, <laughs> minding my own business. I'm going to have to take an extremely long pee now. <laughs> uh, so uh, we get a little scene in Saru's quarters where he is packing his bags and uh, telling Michael Burnham how to look after all his plants. How shocked were you that the quarters are going to remain the same? He's not packing up the plants. He's not taking the plants with him? Is Trina just like really particular about her personal space? She's like, no, nah, I don't want any of your stuff. I mean, I, I guess it makes sense. Like there's no way he's getting the cleaning deposit back and there's no way the next crew person is going to want to live there. Those quarters are fucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, and he put holes in the walls, you know, like he hung pictures. You're not supposed to do that. I want to ask you about this scene because this is another scene of two best buds doing the eulogy thing to each other, even though they're both still alive. I feel like they've had this with Michael Burnham and Saru specifically a bunch of times, too. I know we've talked a lot over the course of the years about, like, the depiction of command and to a lesser extent, like, masculinity, but really, like, command and the structures and the hierarchy of command have suggested for a long time that, like, you keep that shit to yourself. You button it up tight, you keep it close, even if you really have a great amount of affection and respect for someone that you work with, like, you don't put it on main. Right. And I think what that does dramatically on a TV show is it makes a moment when those feelings are finally con confessed, they feel very cathartic when that finally happens. And with a show like Discovery, when everyone is, is so open at all times about those feelings... 
I think you're prevented from getting there in scenes like this because these characters have always been open with each other. Like there's actually a benefit to having held back for a little bit in order to Right. In order to get off emotionally in a in a scene like this is what I'm saying, you know? And like It's like dynamic range in music. Like they're yeah. like the loud parts don't sound loud if the whole song is loud. Like you need the quiet parts to make the the loud parts loud. I get that we're trying to model good behavior and I think it's great and it's good behavior, but like it doesn't quite work in this context for that reason. Like I want to feel what the show wants me to feel, but if all it is is that high dynamic range. You're right. Mm-hmm. The yeah. emotional high dynamic range is just too omnipresent. Burnham pays a visit to Admiral who gets hit on by all the moms when he picks his kid up from school. They have a little conversation, surprisingly, about Rainer. He's like been put on early retirement and they're like, yeah, like what a what an intense dude. I mean, like made a bad call in the field that time, but like always rode for Starfleet, always put the uh, the needs of the Federation first. He was a real one. How could you talk about anything besides how much of the surfaces of this home, the home that Admiral Guy you're somehow rooting for, even though he's the bad guy in a World War II movie, <laughs> and his family live, his family with small children, all of this, these piano black surfaces in there, that is a full-time job to clean that that condo, Admiral. There are like a hundred dots that come through there like <laughs> once an hour. <laughs> yeah. The dots see everything. They see it all. Yeah. yeah. Evidently, Rayner did not take the forced retirement conversation well and kind of stormed off. And Michael Burnham goes to find him in a place that doesn't seem like it's his quarters, right? This is a public place the way Michael just kind of waltzes right in there into the telescope room yeah like he says something about it's a free galaxy mostly Mm -hmm. she wouldn't say about like your your bedroom (laughs) he's been looking through that telescope at discovery what are you looking at rainer how's the peeping tommy how's the peeping tommy how's the peeping Tommy, 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 Tommy. Hey, this is a scene about how second chances are good, actually. Hmm. Yeah. Rainer's going to get one. Yeah. In fact, he is going to be the first officer that Michael Burnham selects. And she is counting on him being the guy that tells her when he thinks she's wrong, which is very interesting. Like, she... She was the the first officer that got thrown in the brig for going freelance in the middle of a mission it, at the very beginning of this series. And it's like she is looking for another Michael Burnham type to be her, her first officer now. It's really going full circle, isn't it? Wow. I mean, this is a conversation that, that mirrors what happened in the very beginning, right? Rainer seems to be a man without a mission. What is his life for? Michael Burnham gives him that purpose in this scene. Yeah. Do you recognize the ears? Do we know what species he is? There isn't a ton about Rainer online, but what I found was human. What? Yeah. Over and over again, human. And it looks like there's a bite chewed out of one of them, but not both. One of them definitely looks messed up. So with Rainer being Burnham's number one, I got to ask. How soon does Rainer mutiny her <laughs> this season? Because I got to believe that's coming. It really feels like it's got to be coming, right? Like, yeah, it'd be so delicious for her to get a mutiny. Like, I know Sonequa Martin-Green has this gear. The look on her face when he finally mutinies her, she's got to be like, God damn it. You know, <laughs> I should have seen it coming because you're me, right? I thought I was the scorpion. It turns out I'm the frog. <laughs> Wait, are we both scorpions or are we both frogs? <laughs> Did you like this episode, Adam? She'll always bring it home. I really did. And I think it's mostly because of its set piece. Like the Indiana Jones slash Goonies-ness of this 
is really fun so far. And it's so Gooniousness, like up to and including the part where the poetry, the Romulan poetry is a part of it. Like yeah. this this feels like playing the keys on the bone piano in the Goonies. There's just nothing like my mother's Steinway. Do something, boy. We're unlocking these clues to open up a path to this other set of clues to go to a different place. I mean, I love that stuff and it feels like a throwback. Like if you grew up watching those two movies, like I feel like a lot of the creative people involved in the show were like, this is right over the plate. This is pretty fun. And it remains to be seen how they're able to sustain this. Like how many more episodes do we get before we're kind of uh clue lash? Mm. But yeah, I don't know. I thought it was good. Here's what I'm going to say. I don't want to go back to Trill. <laughs> I'm kind of done with the Trill. Yeah, I like those spears everybody carries around on Trill. I wouldn't mind seeing seeing somebody get whacked with one of those. I'm ready to be surprised and delighted by what Trill looks like right now. But at this point, like, how can you improve a koi pond, really? <laughs> Like, how fucking cool could it possibly be? Because it's awesome, I'm going to tell you all about the livestock trough that I have turned into a goldfish tank. Fair enough. <laughs> what about you, Ben? I also really liked this episode, and I share your concern that, like, I'm not sure if a go to planet A and pick up artifact B every week for five weeks is going to be the last season I'm hoping for. Um, I'm hoping that it is a more interesting structure than that. And yet this episode was delightful. And I thought it was, um, I mean, aside from all that fucking shit floating in the air everywhere, uh, a very interesting place to be when they beam down to this planet, the production stuff that they are able to achieve on this show is so impressive you know, going from desert planet last week to lush, verdant jungle planet this week and having it like all look real and cool and good is just amazing. And uh, I liked Michael Burnham zagging when we thought she was going to zig and uh, and picking Rainer as her first officer. And I really liked Rainer saying yes to the, to the ask mm -hmm. because like the other thing about that is like you've got to have some fucking ego on you if you've been a captain and you've been in the fleet for 30 years. And you've been on six red directive missions or whatever. Like he is agreeing to like take a, a nut stomp to stay in the fleet. So it means to me that he is more dedicated to Starfleet than he is to his own ego in an interesting way. I don't know if I agree with you there, man. I think he sees this as an angle to the chair. You don't just turn off your ambition like that. He's going to be a real problem. I don't think he's going to be willing to just be an XO for long. Wow. I really think this is going to be a conflict right from jump. Well, we shall see, mon frere. Do you want to see if there's anything you feel conflicted about in the Priority One inbox? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's coming out of a statue, Ben. <laughs> a statue's <laughs> eyeballs. Priority One message from Starfleet coming in on secured channel. Our first P1 is of a promotional nature, and it goes like this. All geared up for SG-1 and nowhere to go? Join Sarah and Tori over at SG Fun. It's about comfort, laughs, and two people who don't know as much as they should about Stargate. That's SG Fun, the number one listen-to Stargate podcast according to Podbean. The only metric that matters. How about that? Find us everywhere quality podcasts are sold and at the seventh symbol.com and we're on season six so we aren't going anywhere and there's plenty to binge come try uh so listen to sg fun a stargate podcast stargate sg fun get it uh, wherever you get your podcasts please do ben our second priority one message is from defested whoa it's to ben and adam and adam and ben and ben and adam love defested their message goes like this you had me worried at the start of SG-1, about not enjoying any of the pilots, but the reveal <laughs> about actually liking it was great. SG-1 was just as formative as Star Trek for me and my love of sci-fi. I recommend continuing. Also, you do know someone who has watched Farscape, right? Me! Why, you might ask? 
Was it the lizard leather daddy? And then there's that, uh, like, that shrug emoji. Oh, yeah. Lizard leather daddy. Yeah, I mean, look, when you watch a lot of these sci-fi shows at a formative age, your interests (laughs) will also be formed. Uh, For instance, my interest in ketchup. Ketchup. More ketchup. I think I'm extra ketchup. I like that uh, Divested here has uh, clarified that their pronouns are they, he, and then tight slash scaly are the pronouns for Lizard Leather Daddy. Sure are. Well, uh, great to see Defested back in the P1s. Yeah. Hey, what's up, Defested? Always nice to hear from you. Uh, and uh, always nice to hear from anybody that uh, gets a P1. We've got a lot of inventory to fill here on the last season of Disco. So if you would like to get a Priority One message, I recommend getting it in soon. It's MaximumFun.org slash Jumbotron to do it. Hey, Ben. What's that, Adam? Did you discover yourself in Edward Larkin? Edward Larkin. This is like maybe an off-screen Edward Larkin, but I really wanted the camera to cut to Adira when the reveal was that they were going to Trill and have them just like, like, damn it! (laughs) (laughs) I really... (laughs) It seems like next episode will be the episode where this is rectified a bit. I felt like Blue Del Barrio had not gotten very much to do in the last two episodes. There's a lot of pool type areas on Trill. Maybe uh maybe Gray could have an accident. <laughs> you think Adir is gonna kill him? <laughs> there are Miriam true crime documentaries. <laughs> <laughs> on streaming as we speak, Ben. And, and guess what? Most of them go something like that. The perfect crime. Yeah, yeah. I think that feeling of I am surprised to be liking this new circumstance and I want to explore liking it and then having the rug yanked out from under them, like the moment they give voice to that, <laughs> like kind of kind of brutal and cruel irony by the show. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel like that's my uh, my Edward Larkin for this episode. How about you? I'm going to go with dirt bike rental guy. <laughs> Another off screen. For causing an absolute political mess <laughs> in the wake of what happened on, on their planet. I mean, dirt bike rental guys got to get paid. Yeah, it's true. The squeaky dirt bike wheel gets the money. <laughs> gets the latinum, I guess. That is the thing they say. Well, this last segment on the show, called Warning Boise, we call it that because we feel like a recommendation for our podcast should come with a tone that would warn off somebody that doesn't dig the kind of vibe that we bring to the table. Um, But we really appreciate when people uh, recommend the show on social media or leave a nice review on Apple Podcasts. And so we like to shout those out here. Prepare a buoy and launch it when ready. Warning buoys. An emergency buoy. A warning buoy. This one is from At Graceful Failure on Blue Sky, who wrote, After listening to the entire Voyager run of Greatest Gen, I think I finally understand the distinction. Ben and Adam should be a little bit embarrassed for having a Star Trek podcast, but that embarrassment is almost a Christ-like sacrifice to save us from our own embarrassment. You know what's great about that read, Ben, is as you were reading it, I did a crucifixion pose. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And because I'm I'm using a Mac OS device, uh, like the entire <laughs> screen changed into... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it it, uh, it floated little little bloody stigmata yeah. <laughs> on your palms. And... I know. <laughs> How do you turn this off? <laughs> and then like it started raining and then balloons started coming out of my stigmata wounds. I love all those stories we're seeing now about like big layoff meetings at huge corporations and like the, the CEO gets frustrated and storms out of the room because everybody's stigmata emotes are, yeah. are uh, distracting him while he's trying to lay them off yeah friend of DeSoto Ben Fritz uh, hit us up to let us know that like an actual article in the Wall Street Journal was published having to do with this but we broke the story first yeah we didn't get name checked in the article or anything yeah 
Fucking Rupert Murdoch and his bullshit. <laughs> well, Ben, that's all we got, isn't it? It sure is. This episode is going to be edited by the great Rob Adler, who uh, recently came aboard as a uh, social media and marketing director for us. How much more is he than those things, though? So much more. So much more. God, he's he's great. Yeah, he really rolls. Uh, and uh, he's also still in the rotation as uh, one of our regular editors here on Greatest Trek. So we're going to let Rob take it from here. Bye-bye. Greatest Trek is an Uxbridge Shimoda podcast on the Maximum Fun Network. It's hosted by Ben Harrison and Adam Pranica, and it's produced by Wendy Pretty. And this episode was edited by Rob Adler. Later this week, on Friday, Ben and Adam will be back with coverage of Season 5, Episode 3 of Star Trek Discovery, called Janal. On Trill, Captain Burnham, Book, and Culber must pass a dangerous test to prove themselves worthy of the next clue. Adira reconnects with Grey, and Saru's first day as ambassador is complicated by his engagement with Tarina. Thanks for your support during the drive. If you missed it, it's never too late to become a member and help support the pod. Go to MaximumFun.org slash join and get instant access to all the bonus content available to members. Thanks to Adam Ragusea, who composed the theme music for Greatest Trek. You can find him on YouTube at A Ragusea. Thanks to Nick Dittmore for creating the show art. As always, thanks to the car daddy, Bill Tilly, who's managing our various social media pages and is working with me in putting out some new content on all of our social media pages. We've just added a new Facebook page and a TikTok account. So be sure to find us on your favorite social media platform at Greatest Trek. And thanks for listening. We'll see you later this week on Greatest Trek. Hey, just off to the side, just for me and you, you're having a great show. (laughs) You're really killing it right now. Hell yeah. (laughs) Yeah! (laughs) Echo Peeper 607! (laughs) Maximum Fun. A worker-owned network. Of artist-owned shows. Supported. Directly. By you.